All right, it is 2 o'clock, um, so we are going to get started um, on our safety plans are changing what you need to know webinar this afternoon. Um, so when talk with you a little bit about this webinar. Um, this webinar was developed through partnership between the North Carolina Division of Social Services and the Family and Children's Resource Program, who many of you know we are part of the Jordan Institute for Families, which is at the UNC Chapel Hill School Social Work. Uh, we do want you to know that this webinar is being recorded, and we are going to make that recording available um, in the next few days so that you can share this with others who are not able to attend, um, and that will be available on ncswlearn.org. So the goals for this webinar is that we want you to be able to understand the definition of the term temporary parental safety agreement, which is a bit of a change in term. We want you to know the practice requirements for using temporary parental safety agreements, and we want you to know when you should seek court intervention. So let me talk a little bit about communication. I can see many of you are already using the chat pod. Um, there are so many of us here. The chat, you will notice that the chat pod will be flying past, um, but we will do our best to keep track of what's in there. Um, you can type into the main chat pod, and everyone who is inside the room will see your chat. If you need to send a message to one of us hosts or presenters privately, you can just hover over our name and start private chat. So if you are having any technical difficulties or any issues that you need to be addressed and you want to chat privately with someone, I strongly recommend that you do that um, because given the number of participants we have and how fast the chat pod is going, we might miss something if you are needing assistance. So please try to use that individual chat feature if you need an answer from one of us directly. So I want to talk a little bit about questions. Um, typically in these webinars, we leave time for questions, um, which we have done um, at the end of the webinar. Um, however, this is the largest number of attendees we've ever had for a webinar, and um, we're going to be doing our best to track the themes of the questions that are in the chat pod. Um, so behind the scenes, uh, John McMain is going to be tracking your questions, and collecting them for us to have ready at the end of the session. Um, so please do type your questions into the chat pod, but know that we may not answer them at that moment. Um, if we end up with time at the end of our session, we will answer as many of the questions as we can that are common themes. But we do want you to know that there will be a follow-up document where we will summarize all frequently asked questions, um, and we will um, get that out to you as soon as possible. Um, so please, we'll do our best. And just bear with us. Another way that you can get our attention during this webinar is to use the icons. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the icons, you can see that at the top of the screen above the slides, there's an icon of a person w w waving their hand or raising their hand. There's an arrow next to that person, and you can click on that and select a variety of ways to communicate with us. Uh, you can see the choices there on your screen. So if you need to get our attention and we're not getting attention from you in the chat pod, please use the icons and that, that typically does let us um, see that you need something. So typically we do a poll at the beginning of these um, events to find out who's in the room. Uh, we are not going to be able to do that today because we have so many people in the room, but we do have some numbers for you just so you can have a sense of who's here. So at our latest count, our total registrations were 1,535 participants. Um, we have over 700 with direct client contact, like child welfare staff. We have 22 agency directors of child welfare and social work. We have 295 supervisors. We have 85 program managers and program administrators. We have 22 trainers and staff development professionals. And we have court folks. Um, from NCSW Learn, let's see, we've got 145 people from the courts. So we have a lot of our court partners here today. So we're glad to have everybody here, and we hope that we're going to be able to get your, your questions answered and get some information out to you um, 
as quickly as possible. All right, so um, I'm going to introduce myself and then let the rest of our panelists introduce themselves to you so you know who you're listening to. Um, my name is Laura Phipps. Um, I am a clinical assistant professor at UNC School of Social Work at the Jordan Institute. Um, I have trained in the classroom and online and probably know many of you and many of you know me, so I'm glad you're all here and um, we welcome you. We also have um, Philip Armfeld and John McMahon are here providing um, technical support. As I said, John's going to be tracking the questions in the chat space. Philip is available if you have any challenges with technology. Technology. So I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves, and we'll go ahead and start with Arletta. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Arletta Lambert, and I'm a child welfare policy consultant with the North Carolina Division of Social Services, focusing on all aspects of child welfare, with particular emphasis on child protective services. In this position, I analyze, evaluate, develop, refine and interpret child welfare policy, child welfare funding, and related issues. And I have served as the point person for the division safety planning project. Thank you, Arletta. Um, let's now hear from Dee. Hold on one second, Dee is having some technical issues, so let's go on to Kevin. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Barrio. I hear Kevin So um, we're not hearing Kevin either, so I'm going to go ahead and go on to Jamie and while Philip works with Kevin and Dee. Hello, my name is Jamie Hamlet. I'm the staff attorney with the Alamance County Department of Social Services. I've been working in this position for approximately 13 years. Um, I work in the area of child welfare, but I also cover the areas of adult protective services, child support, and then any type of issues related to personnel and other areas that the agency may need me. Great, thanks Jamie. Let's try D again. Let's see if we can hear from D. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dee Hunt. I serve as a program monitor for the program monitoring team. And I uh, am enjoying this position. And prior to that, I spent 17 years with staff development in child welfare. Prior to that, I spent 17 years with the Cleveland County Department of Social Services doing an array of services there. And it's just very exciting to be here today. Great, thanks, Dee. And let's see if we've got Kevin working. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Kevin Marino. I'm from Montgomery County DSS. I'm the Deputy Director. And um, prior to DSS, I served over 13 years in family-centered treatment in the mental health world and substance abuse. And have really enjoyed my position in child welfare and now as Deputy Director. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I, I have seen a couple comments that some people are having um, sound going in and out. Typically, that is bandwidth on your end. Um, but if you are continuing to have trouble, I encourage you to highlight over Philip and private chat with him. Um, otherwise, we're not going to be able to catch your issue as it zips through the chat. So um, we want to help you as much as possible. Uh, but we probably need you to have use that in a private chat so we can know exactly what's going on. Um, there was a question a moment ago in the presenter, pa um, presenter pod. And um, John has captured that question. And we will be answering that at the end of our time together. So thank you all for being here for this great learning opportunity for all the child welfare staff and court partners we have with us today. Uh, we will be giving out some contact information at the end of our webinar um, for all of you to be able to stay in touch. All right, so the agenda for today, um, first of all, we're going to give you some background and some rationale as to why things are changing in this particular area. And then regarding the temporary parental safety agreements, we will be giving you a definition, um, some basic goals, and some specific practice requirements. 
Uh, then we're going to spend a little bit of time on specifically when court intervention is indicated. Um, we're going to hear some experiences from Jamie and Kevin about what's been happening within their own counties. And then, like I said, if we have time, we're going to do our best to answer some questions. So I'm going to pass it now over to Dee, um, who's going to get us started with our content today. Thank you very much, Laura. The first thing we want to ask is a question, and the question is, why are we revisiting policy and practice around the use of safety plans? Well, there's actually a very good reason. First, over the past few years, safety resource placements have frequently been used by CPS to help ensure safety, permanence, and well-being for children and their families. There's been some trends that we have also been looking at, and they are frequent use of those safety resource placements and children remaining in those safety resource placements for long periods of time, yes, sometimes years. So the revisions to North Carolina's policies and practice guidelines around the use of safety resource placements, which you will hear more about in a minute, were significantly influenced by, one, the findings and recommendations of an in-home services work group composed of statewide representation of county child welfare staff. Number two, the results of research regarding updated child welfare practice in other states regarding safety planning and safety assessments. And three, the program improvement plan strategy of strengthening North Carolina's safety and risk policies. So as you think about your agency's use of safety resource placements, let's now take a look at the first poll question. If you will watch your screen for that. So the first polling question is this. During the initial safety assessment, how often does your agency use placement of the child outside of the home with the safety resource as a component of the safety response? Rarely, less than half the time, frequently, almost always, I have no idea. OK. And I'm seeing them coming in. Looks right now that frequently is winning. And not by hair, not by nose, but by long shot. Very good. And we're going to let those just climb. And what we're going to do is we're going to broadcast the results in just a moment. And thank you very much for participating in the poll in question. So it looks like more than half of everyone that's involved in the poll question says that over half the time, they are definitely using that. 50.2% of the time is what 50% of the time is what it looks like. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to end that poll right now, and now we're going to go on to the next one. We'd like to ask you another question: How often do these safety resource placements continue into in-home services? Is it rarely, less than half the time, frequently, almost always, or I have no idea? And here we are, and this is the one that we spoke about earlier when we talked about children sometimes remaining in a safety resource placement for years. And so as you can see, it, you're seeing that almost always is winning. So this right here alone tells you the reason why North Carolina had to revisit our use of safety resource placements. And I would say right now that let's go ahead and end the poll so we can keep going. And we now know why we are doing this. So learning about the improvements occurring in other states regarding safety planning during CPS assessments, we were reminded of the, importance, or the important role of the core elements of child welfare practice in North Carolina. 
Now, as you look at your slide, these core elements play key roles in the development and the implementation of the new safety planning policies and practice in North Carolina. Balancing children's safety and parents' rights, family-centered practice, holistic assessments, structured decision making. So number one, when we talk about balancing children's rights and parents' rights, for example, CPS work faces the challenges of balancing that parents' rights to the care, custody, and control of their children with the children's rights to basic care and protection from harm. Next, family-centered practice is our model for engaging families about both their needs and their strengths. And it's our model for engaging families in a way that protects their rights. Not losing sight of the importance of comprehensive assessments of families, not just assessing the alleged incident, et cetera. Broad-based assessments provide us with an opportunity to understand the family's strengths and needs in multiple areas, and then how those strengths and needs impact safety and risk factors. And I know some of you remember that since 2002, structured decision-making tools from intake through case decision have helped us improve the consistency of CPS decision-making in North Carolina, today just focusing on the safety assessment process and tool. And so now we're going to take a little transition. And all of you uh, on the line, most of you, especially the one who's actually doing the work at uh, in CPS, or child welfare, have had pre-service and you've had an opportunity to actually talk about safety and risk. I want you to look at your screen right now. And as you look at that screen, I want you to think about safety and then think about risk. So while we're going to focus primarily on safety assessment and planning, in order to do that critical work, we want to examine the distinction between the two safety and risk. So one way to differentiate between safety and risk is to think about the deer crossing sign. So what does it mean when you see the deer crossing sign? Does it mean there is a deer standing there ready to cross the road in front of you? No, but it does mean that because of known statistics that increase the chances of a deer in this area, there is an increased risk that a deer will be present. On the other hand, if you come around a curb and see a deer standing in front of you, whoa, there are present and immediate safety concerns for you. That is why it's important for us to understand safety and risk. Because if a child is at that much of a safety issue, then we may want to think about some other things. All right, so what I'd like for you to do is um, to type into to something into chat for me. As you're thinking, as we're getting ready to put that up, safety is a subset of risk. All safety concerns are risk issues. But I want you to remember that not all risk concerns are safety issues. So that's the one thing that you have to remember. All safety concerns are risk issues, but not all risk issues are safety issues as you think about the signs that you just saw. So let's get back to chat. I want you to type into chat for me, what is one challenge that CPS assessors currently face when assessing safety and determining safety responses for CPS cases in your agency? So looking at the screen, type into chat for me, one challenge CPS assessors currently face when assessing safety and determining safety responses for CPS cases, cases in your agency. And I know you can think about some of the cases that you have right now, some that you've had before. Drug use and how much risk for the child is created. Good. Wonderful. Mental health, substance use, oh yeah. Drug use, DV, mental health. You know, honestly, I think all of you must work for the same agency. We are seeing some of the same issues, drug abuse, drug, drug use, substance abuse. High caseloads are in there. The validity of the report, experience, parents' rights. So there are so many things that we have to consider as a CPS assessor when we are assessing the safety 
and determining that safety response. So while the intersection of safety and risk is one challenge when assessing safety, there are certainly many others. There's also the complexity of the family dynamics, especially when we are talking about substance abuse and domestic violence. What about that prior history of CPS? What about the lack of support in family and kin and, uh, and, and placement resources? So very good. And, and as I see, lack of a reliable mental health resources. So all of those are challenges. And we do hear you out there. And that's why we're here to support you. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to transition to Arletta. And she's going to talk a little bit. Uh, she's going to go into the temporary parental safety agreements. Arletta? Thanks, Dee. With the distinctions between safety and risk in mind and the multiple challenges that CPS assessors face, let's define temporary parental safety agreements. A temporary parental safety agreement is a voluntary and short-term plan between a parent and a county child welfare agency during the assessment phase of a case if a child is in immediate danger in his or her own home because of a safety threat. So if you look at your slide, um, we have some graphics there that point out some of the key words um, that are a part of this definition. Um, voluntary, short term, during the assessment, immediate danger. Um, and so the most critical thing I want y'all to remember about a temporary parental safety agreement is that it is meant to be short term and temporary and it is now only a resource during the CPS assessment phase of a case. As, As you will see in the webinar room, there are documents that are, can, you can download. Um, so you may want to go ahead and do that or do that after the um, webinar is over. I know we, I saw a couple of questions around that. Um, you should have also received them when you received your confirmation for this webinar. So at this time, it may be helpful if you want to pull out your policy handout, um, have it in front of you so that you can look at it, maybe make notes on it, um, those kinds of things. Those are meant to be resources for you. And so if you look at this slide, we really want to focus on the two types of safety threats. Present safety threat refers to an immediate, significant, and clearly observable family condition. So it's like severe harm or th threat of severe harm occurring to a child in the present. This sort of uh, danger or safety threat is easier to detect because it's tran transparent and is occurring now. If present danger is observed, the child is not safe. Now compare that to impending safety threat. This refers to threatening conditions that are not immediately obvious or currently active, but are out of control and likely to cause serious harm to a child in the near future. These sorts of safety threats are probably not as obvious as present safety threats. Um, impending danger is a threat that is reasonably expected to result in serious harm if safety action is not taken and or sustained. These threats may or may not be identified at the onset of, onset of the involvement by the county child welfare agency, but are understood upon a more complete evaluation and understanding of the individual family conditions and functions. So a few examples of safety threats are hitting and beating, um, injuries to the face or head, caregiver unable to provide basic care, those types of things, things that you see every day in your practice. Um, and so the difference, though, between present and impending is that with present, the incident has happened or evidence of that can be seen. Impending is the incident hasn't happened, but the social worker expects for them to happen soon. So to further look at these safety threats um, 
and in order to be classified as such, a situation, condition, or behavior must meet the safety threshold. And so we have here on the slide the definition of safety threshold. And it says, the point when a parent's behaviors, attitudes, emotions, intent, or circumstances create conditions that fall beyond mere risk of future maltreatment and have become an actual imminent threat to the safety. So these are the types of conditions that could reasonably result in the serious and unacceptable pain and suffering of a vulnerable child. In looking at this slide, again, you may find it helpful to look at page one of your policy handout. So there are four main categories of safety actions that may be incorporated into a temporary parental safety agreement. The first that you have is resource support. And this refers to safety actions that address a shortage of family resources and resource utilization. So maybe things like obtaining water, electricity, food, child care, those types of things. And the absence of those types of resources directly threatens the safety of the child. The second type of safety action is social support. And these include actions that will reduce social isolation. So when these are utilized appropriately, it reinforces and supports the capacity of the parent or other caretakers. The third type of safety action is crisis management. This is specifically concerned with intervening to bring a halt to a crisis and to facilitate problem solving to bring a state of calm to a family. The purpose of crisis management is to quickly control the threat to the child's safety. And finally, separation or restriction. This refers to the removal of any household member from the home for a period of time or otherwise interfering with a parent's custodial rights. Both are viewed as temporary actions. Separation may involve, among other things, the child temporarily moving to a safe environment, a friend moving into the home, the protective parent moving with the child to a safe environment, a parent agreeing not to have unsupervised contact with the child, a parent agreeing to forfeit decision-making authority over that child, or the alleged perpetrator agreeing to leave the home. Just a few examples. But I want to remind you that separation must always be the last resort when we are looking at the types of safety actions. For a child, a move out of his or her home is traumatic. The relationship with his or her parent is the most important one in their life. Even if the parent is experiencing issues, the child still loves them and in most instances wants to continue living with them. Earlier we mentioned the importance of attention to both parents' rights and children's rights. Safety actions falling under the separation or restriction category affect a parent's custodial rights. When a county child welfare agency interferes with this right, Reasonable procedural protections must be in place, and this protection for parents often takes the form of a hearing in juvenile court. And so if you look at the slide, this was just kind of a summary for what the basic goals of a temporary parental safety agreement are. And so we want them to, they are sufficient to manage safety. They are reasonably tailored to the allegations provided in the report and the safety issues that exist within the family. They have to be immediately available so that they are capable of being in an operation the same day it's created. And a plan that includes actions and goals that are specific and measurable. So let's take a look at two of the practice requirements for these temporary parental safety agreements. Temporary parental safety agreements must be unquestionably voluntary and revocable. And so when we talk about the voluntary nature of them, this really talks about any placement not pursuant to a statutory authority or court order must be voluntary. 
and then revocable, um, there must be a procedure outlined and explained to the family about how they can um, review and or revoke any part of the agreement. And so again, I would um, remind you to look at your documents that you received. Um, if you will look at section E, which I believe is um, page 7 of that document, this really is the um, part of the safety assessment that is the temporary parental safety agreement. It further elaborates and provides the specifics of the safety interventions that are voluntarily agreed upon as a result of the um, CPS assessor's safety assessment discussion with the family. And then if you flip over and look at Part F of the safety assessment, this includes the language around the voluntary nature of the agreement and the option to revoke that agreement. And so as we continue to examine the practice requirements associated with temporary parental safety agreements, let's look, uh, take a look at the actual definitions of what voluntary and coercive mean. And so voluntary, the definition for that is that it is done, made, brought about, undertaken, et cetera, of one's own accord or by free choice. Compare that to the definition of coercive which means using force or threats to make someone do something. The practice of forcing another party to act in an involuntary manner by use of intimidation or threats or some other form of pressure or force. We mentioned earlier that family-centered practice continues to be one of the cornerstones of child welfare practice in North Carolina and of this new safety planning process. On this slide, you'll see a few questions that reflect the approach that families are the expert about their families and that they can pull from their past experiences to identify possible safety interventions. We know from research that open-ended, solution-focused, exception questions have been shown to be effective when working with families. Some of these questions you see on the slide were developed by Alamance County DSS. So I'm going to call on Jamie. Um, please share with us how these questions came to be and what prompted their development. Um, thank you. Social workers have always had questions about what is coercion and when is the line crossed from educating or encouraging a parent to coercion. As a result of these questions, the program manager and myself tried to develop some guidelines to assist social workers. We also pointed out that using motivational interviewing skills or reflective listening are important components. We encouraged the social workers to ensure that the parent was in an environment where the parent feels safe to have a discussion of this nature. And explaining the purpose and the process to the parent, because people are motivated to make changes if they feel empowered. And one way to empower a person is to provide them information and education on the process. We also advise social workers to always be honest about the duties of the department and to explain the potential outcomes, especially when a parent is inquiring. Thanks, Jamie. So I would invite those of you who are um, participating with us today um, to enter into chat some other statements or questions that you could use or that you do use currently that models this voluntary approach with families in getting them to um, help identify the safety concerns and the safety interventions. I can see everyone's fingers typing away. Identifying strengths, yes, I, I think that's a very important point that we do want to um, key into those strengths and play on those and use those um, to help ensure ch the child is safe. I love the questions about, you know, what have you done in the past? How has that worked for you? Using family and friends, very nice. Very nice. Continue entering those in, and, and we will um, be happy to capture those. So earlier we mentioned that there are two requirements 
of safety assessments that must be in place. They must be unquestionably voluntary, which we just talked about, and they must be revocable. Revoke means to withdraw agreement to the formally agreed upon provisions of the temporary parental safety agreement. Again, I would draw your attention to part F of the safety assessment tool. Number three specifically says, I understand that I have the right to revoke and or have the safety agreement reviewed at any time. The parent could revoke any or all of the agreement. They may revoke in verbally or in writing, but the county child welfare agency must be notified if that parent is revoking. It is not sufficient to simply say, you know, tell the temporary safety provider, for example, or tell the next door neighbor. They, the county child welfare agency must be notified. The county child welfare agency must also document that revocation and take any action necessary uh, to, to ensure the child's safety. This could mean reassessing the safety factors, having more discussion about the safety intervention options with families, et cetera. Each county child welfare agency may identify its own process for parents to notify the agency when they wish to revoke. Whether this has to be in writing, um, if it's going to be verbal, whom do they call, um, what's the process look like if it's after hours or on the weekend. Um, so each county should identify that for themselves and then um, make sure each family knows what the process is for that county. Jamie, I know that your agency developed its own parent guardian notice and acknowledgement of rights document, which includes a place to revoke the safety agreement. Please share with us a little bit about how you came to develop that document and if or how it's been helpful to your social workers and the family they serve. Well, Alamance County wanted to create a plan that was, a, create a form that was as complete as possible and address the issues of concern and educated the parents on their due process rights. We also wanted the social workers to have a form that they could work from that would help them in educating parents about their rights. So we did create a form that we referred to as the Parent Guardian Notice and Acknowledgement of Rights. At the bottom of the form, the parent or legal, legal guardian checks one of the three following. Agree to the safety plan with the understanding that at any point during the plan I may revoke or end my agreement or ask for a review of the plan. Not agree with the plan. Agree with the plan now, but also request a review of the safety plan by the social work supervisor and another person not directly involved in my case. Underneath that provision, there is a place where the parent or legal guardian can sign withdrawing consent. This places all parties on notice that the consent can be revoked and provides a, quote, paper trail, which will assist with supporting why later actions were taken or not taken. It also places, gives the temporary safety provider knowledge of the situation and the potential outcomes. Thanks, Jamie. So there are a couple of instances when a temporary parental safety agreement is not appropriate. And so those are outlined on this slide. The first being if there is one that is, it would be insufficient to ensure the safety of the child. Or there is reason to suspect that the parent, guardian, or custodian won't abide by the agreement. So some concrete examples of this, um, especially the first bullet, include, say the alleged victim has serious physical injuries that were not accidental. I'm talking about abusive head trauma, shaken baby, numerous bro broken bones. We also talk about that you have had a previous safety plan executed and the parent didn't adhere to it then. Um, and then also, of course, if the parent is indicating that he will not, he or she will not agree to it. Those are when it would absolutely not be appropriate and you would have to consider other options. In continuing our discussion regarding the practice requirements, this one is associated with visitation and temporary parental safety agreements. 
only the court may require supervised visitation between a parent and that parent's child. An exception would be when an arrangement for supervised visits or, quote, no contact is totally voluntary on the part of the parent, just like with any other part action of the temporary parental safety agreement. For more details about this particular requirement, you may want to refer to the section in the policy about court involvement and specifically, visitation, specifically the visitation component. I believe that's on page four. One more practice requirement for the use of temporary parental safety agreements is that they are developed with families using the safety assessment and that they are only available during the assessment phase of the case. I mentioned this earlier when I defined what a temporary parental safety agreement was. Temporary parental safety agreements involving separation or restriction are available only during the assessment phase of a child welfare case. The exception would be if you have an open in-home case and you receive new allegations that constituted a new assessment being opened up on the family. So as a reminder, this means that a case cannot be transferred to in-home services with a child living with a temporary safety provider. And this also means that when there are restrictions on a parent's super, um, contact or in place, a case cannot be transferred to in-home services. One final practice requirement is around CFTs and the development of temporary parental safety agreements. And again, for those of you who are not familiar, CFT is child and family team. So a child and family team is required if a temporary parental safety agreement requiring separation or restriction is being proposed. During the CFT meeting, other safety interventions, as well as possible temporary safety providers, must be discussed. A CFT is also required if non-secure custody is seen as the only means available to ensure the safety of the child. In the event that a CFT cannot be held prior to making the temporary parental safety agreement, or filing for non-secure custody. It shall be held as soon as possible thereafter. And at this point, I'm going to transition back to Dee to tell us a little bit about when court intervention um, must be sought. Thank you very much, Arlette. I appreciate that. And so we've heard about the practice requirements. Now let's talk a little bit about when we should involve the court. Earlier we talked about family-centered practice being the cornerstone or key element of practice. And before we go into court intervention, here is a poll question. So we're going to bring it up. And the poll question is this, involving the court is inconsistent with family-centered practice. Again, the poll question is, involving the court is inconsistent with family-centered practice. This is a yes, no, or I'm clueless answer. OK. Most of you said, no, it is not inconsistent, but we do have some clueless answers. And, and we do have some, yes, it is inconsistent. OK, I think we can close that poll now. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, over half of you, about 87% of you said it was not inconsistent. Those of you who said that it is not, you're correct. Although it may seem that filing a petition in juvenile court could be detrimental to a parent and the family, allowing the parent to have that hearing or another form of due process when his or her protected custodial rights are implicated is consistent with family-centered social work practice. It gives them an opportunity to certainly tell their story. So let's talk about the times when court involvement must be pursued. If you will look at your screen. 
It must be pursued when an agreement that ensures safety of the children cannot be made between the parent and the county child welfare agency. You must involve the court. The temporary safety provider recommended by the family lives in another state unless there's a border agreement, like maybe between North or South Carolina. Court must be pursued. Or a temporary parental safety agreement involving separation is in effect and needs to remain in effect at the time the case decision is made. You must pursue the court. Let's look at the next slide. The most family-centered thing you can do is first try less intrusive strategies to keep the child safe. And if those aren't possible, then allow the parents the opportunity to be represented and have their case heard in court. Court is not all bad. Respecting the parents' rights to tell their side uh, their side in court is family-centered. I'm sure you've probably heard this over and over again. This is from our colleague, Holly McNeil, the MRS consultant and trainer. Thanks, Holly, for that statement. We appreciate that. I would like for you to just give some thoughts about that right now. If you uh, believe in that, if you think that is absolutely something that you believe in, you can certainly um, type something in chat about that. Basically, Holly's uh, thoughts talks more about the resources, social support, crisis intervention, um, before separation and restriction. So remember, we went back to the polling. If you go back to the poll question, it talked about family center practice. Most of you do believe that. Yes, Michelle definitely agrees with Holly. And most of you agree. You agree. You agree. And so true. And thank you very much for those responses. So I'm going to now turn it over to um, Laura for her to facilitate the next piece. Laura? Great. Thanks, Dee. Um, so we're going to look at some experiences from our two county representatives. Um, so Jamie's going to let us know a little bit more, since we've heard some already, about what's been going on in Alamance County. And Kevin's going to talk with us about Montgomery County. Um, both, of, both of your counties have changed your approach to safety planning in ways that are consistent with the new policy. So I just want to start with a couple of questions. So first of all, what, do you, what motivated each of you to change your approach to safety planning? And I'm, I'm going to go to you first, Jamie. Um, thank you. Well, first of all, knowing it is right for children and families to attempt to assure safety while using the least restrictive measure um, was a good guiding post. This has been the policy and largely practiced, but all, there's generally always something you can do to improve your practice. Also, preventing the unnecessary removal of children from their families and making a displacement as temporary as possible to prevent further trauma. We also reviewed federal case decisions from other jurisdictions and focused on the fact that parties have due, or parents have due process rights that need to be respected. If we are respectful of our clients, we are more likely to see positive results for children and families. Great. Thanks, Jamie. And how about you, Kevin? What motivated you guys to make some changes? We saw a lot of similarities in what Jamie was saying. And on top of that, we wanted to make sure that we were providing a transparent service uh, to our families to make sure that they completely understood policy and law. Um, because this is a very intrusive uh, relationship that we have with families. And yes, it is traumatic not only for our children, but our parents and for those stakeholders that are involved with the family. So we wanted to evaluate our approach to families and make sure that they understood that we would protect the children, but there were also mechanisms that would protect their rights through the court systems as well. Great, thanks. And then how long have you been implement implementing a revised approach um, to safety planning? How about in Alamance? How long have you guys been doing that? We've been doing it for a little over two months. Okay, and how about you, Kevin? We've been in the endeavor for about a year now. Great. Awesome. All right. So, um, and I did see we had a lot of questions about getting some of the forms that you guys may have used. So we will get back to you guys about that, but we've definitely have tracked those questions. 
All right, so we want to get a little bit more detail into some of the things that you have done. So what steps have you taken to implement um, your new practices and getting them sort of adopted by everyone in your agency? Um, Jamie, why don't you go first? Well, first, we've definitely taken a look at our values and beliefs around safety planning. We've also increased our focus on the use of correct terminology, and we're discussing the distinction between safety and risk, asking questions such as what factors create safety versus risk, asking different questions such as what protective capacities are available within the family or the natural support system. We also gathered information identifying cases where temporary safety um, plans had been put in place and asking if those could be resolved. And if they could not be um, resolved and a less restrictive measure taken into account, um, what did we need to do to assure safety and to assure the protection of due process rights? We've created new forms and an internal protocol, and we've provided training for staff. All right, and uh, what, what about you guys in Montgomery County? What did you do to implement your changes? Along some of the similar guidelines that, that Jamie has discussed, uh, we did have thorough discussions with our uh, district court judge and we have all of our judges that we have conversations with because we have a rotation. Um, in order to understand the impact to uh, longer days in court maybe, I'm sure some of you have those questions on, oh yep, there's some questions popping up. Um, in regards to how it will affect court cases, so yes, you can expect some slight changes in your, in your court case loads um, because you may find that the appropriate steps and even parents deciding that they want us to go ahead and file a juvenile petition, so there will need to be some conversations around not only agency values and beliefs and safety placements, but what do uh, your judges, your GALs, uh, even school personnel, how is this going to affect and impact your community as a whole? Uh, the, the big point that we drilled down on, as Jamie alluded to, is decision making. How do we make um, thorough but responsive decisions with staff? So we have created and implemented a staffing form that we use and require once you initiate a case, any specific changes in a case that looks at the allegations, the interventions provided by the worker, and the outcomes of those interventions provided. We also are looking at and working with uh, a, what we call a live supervision tool that we use out in the field with social workers as we listen to how they talk with families, giving them feedback in the moment. So we're looking and addressing those decision-making points around the different language that they use with families to help provide an atmosphere of live feedback so that we are continually growing and learning how to communicate with families. Uh, no matter what type of allegation that's coming across, if it's sex abuse or um, mom got drunk last night, and we're seeing some effects with that in a positive light. Great, thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions that I, th I think maybe we can address um, with some, some topics that we'd like you guys to cover. Um, so first of all, um, how, how did you handle sort of the confusion or um, resistance to change from, from workers? Um, Kevin, do you want to take that one first? The first approach that we used was it, you can walk into uh, our agency and, and our team and ask them the question, what, what's your focus? And uh, they're going to say safety. I hope they're going to say safety. If you're listening to me, team, you better say safety. Um, and what does that mean specifically when we look at safety? And as we, uh, as Dee and Arletta have walked us through earlier, what is imminent and what is impending? Um, so that's been a major uh, focus with our conversations with staff. and taking time, not being so quick to rush, but explore their thoughts and ideas because they are our frontline staff and, and they get all of the, the wonderful um, gifts that our families give them in the moment um, and we want to take that and listen to it carefully and not implement too much change too fast, but to make sure we do it correctly. 
Great, thank you. Um, so there have been several questions, and you've answered a little bit of this already about the increased filing of petitions. Um, I actually did see, you, I think you said the word slight, and we had a comment of someone saying, really, slight? <laughs> I think they were a little worried about that. Um, so just sort of practically speaking, and I don't know, Jamie, if you want to take this, or Kevin, since you've been doing it a little longer, um, just how has that impact, impacted the workload, the number of cases going to court, how have people dealt with that? Um, well, Laura, I'll begin by talking about the fact that there has been an initial increase in the drafting of, and filing of petitions, but I actually think that there's a hope that we'll, we, we will re see some of that resolve as we go through our in-home cases where we have temporary parental safety agreements in place. Um, because as you begin to take more time, as Kevin said, and not just rush to judgment, but really hone down what are safety issues versus risk, I think you could actually see a reduction in the filing of petitions. Um, we have seen an increase. We generally, and I've seen several questions about, do you have to file a petition and take non-secure? In Alamance County, we have long had a practice of filing what we refer to as general petitions or non-compliance petitions. And it's simply just a petition without the non-secure. And so that's one way of handling this and getting the matter before the court and assuring that all the parties involved have their due process rights. Um, We've also seen a change in how we review cases. Um, and we've taken steps to help educate our community partners, like our judges, the guardian ad litem, um, and the clerk. And we are very fortunate that even today, we have many of our community partners taking part in this webinar, because they're interested in learning more about those change in the policy and practice, and making sure that we continued a family-centered approach, not just before things are brought to court, but also after actions are filed and actions are in court. I think another thing that we've seen in our county that was not directly linked to this policy change, but has helped everyone be more sensitive is we are becoming an trauma-informed agency and doing trauma-informed work across the different venues of our agency and with all of our families. And so that's an important component. And that's part of, and I think this policy goes to supporting that trauma-informed practice. Great. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, and I can see that we still have lots and lots of questions about increased court filings and budget um, time frames. Um, I will say, we'll, we will say this again, that there are going to be many follow-up sessions, uh, live sessions that you can attend to continue to get your questions answered. And we will be doing a follow-up document. So um, please continue to type your questions in, even if we're not able to answer them all right now. Um, so one other question I have, Kevin, is just since you've been doing this a little bit longer, um, do you have any examples of how this has impacted families? Yes, the, the impact to the families has, has been positive. Uh, we're in court. The, um, the juvenile petitions um, to address their, the time frames are different. We don't spend a lot of time in court on those petitions. It, it, there are some, some benefits to filing that. And we are realizing that for a rural county, um, it, it hasn't had a big impact. We've, we've seen probably about a 15 to 20 percent increase in our in our court cases at this time but what it does is that it helps the family go before the judge and tell their story to the judge and we come together and collaborate with the judge to find out what services that are needed and the court can help advocate and help assign providers and services to help us help the family so it's it's been a tremendous impact positively for those families and, and we're seeing that kids are are being returned safely to the homes. Thanks. Jamie, do you have anything to add about how it's impacted families in Alamance County? Um, I actually wanted to share an experience we had. We had a parent who had a child with one mother, and that case was already in the court system. He entered into a temporary parental safety agreement regarding a child with a different mother. Um, subsequent events occurred, and he revoked his consent. And as a result of that, the department filed a petition and took non-secure custody. But it was very empowering that that father knew the court process. He knew what lay ahead of him. But he felt the best decision for his family was to revoke and move into court. Um, I also think that it's important to note that the court, North Carolina Court of Appeals has acknowledged in a recent case that 
safety and risk are different and that we need to be looking more at the demonstrated impact of behaviors on children and not simply focusing on parental behaviors. All right. Um, thank you. That's a great example. So um, any, any last things you guys can think of about either of you or both of you um, in giving some advice to these counties as they deal with or approach this change and how, and how you would, would advise them to handle it? Um, I'll let you guys decide you want, who would like to take it first. You want to go ahead, and Kevin? Or Jamie. Go ahead, Jamie. Well, I'll go ahead and acknowledge that change is difficult, and most of us balk at change and the unknown. However, just like any other change, if you take a deep breath and know that this is a process and you don't have to have all the answers overnight, it will help. I also think it's important to review literature and information that talks about the traumatic impact that removal alone has on children and the need for frequent contact and communication between parents and children to help you appreciate the philosophy that supports this practice. Um, I think remembering that this policy may be new, but it has always been the policy to provide least, re least restrictive alternatives. And it's not truly new, but really just a fine tuning of those skills you already have. And if you're worried about increased workload, there probably will be an increased workload. So let's plan for that. And are there ways that we can work more efficiently without working harder? And sometimes you have to revisit your processes and your procedure. And that's usually an ongoing challenge that you have to do. That's great advice, Jamie. Kevin, is there anything you would add about just how to handle this change? Important to remember is to gather what your staff is saying from your frontline staff, not only your assessors, but also listen to what your intake workers are saying, your in-home workers are saying, your foster care and adoption workers are saying. Listen to what all of them are telling you. Listen to your supervisors, your program managers, and your program administrators, and listen carefully to the feedback. But you're going to have to reach out into the community in your home and have conversations with judges. Uh, you're going to have to evaluate your own program and implement some type of change strategy so that you can make some benchmarks and taking small steps towards the goal here. Um, you're, you're not going to be able to overnight turn a switch in and expect that um, this practice is just going to come alive. It doesn't work that way. So it does take a lot of front-end energy, and that's what we tell our families. Let's spend a lot of front-end energy and find a solution that's going to work for the long term because that will be more effective uh, for everybody in the community. Thank you, guys. I know that, that both of you have been extremely helpful to all of our participants um, in just putting at least hopefully some of their questions um, to rest or at least beginning to answer them and I know that the, that the two counties will be a great resource for everyone. So thanks so much for, for giving us that information. So I am going to pass it over to Arletta. I will say that you know there's been a lot of questions in this last section. We are capturing them um, and we will hopefully have a little time at the end to answer as many as we can. Yes, and I want to just piggyback on a little bit about what Kevin and Jamie said. I see that there's a lot of, um, you know, when is this effective? Do we have to wait until that effective date? And um, this policy and these tools will be effective January 1 of 2017. And um, part of the reason why we are doing all of this advanced training, um, webinar, the face-to-face -face events, those types of things, um, is so that we can go ahead or, or that y'all can go ahead and get ahead of this. If you know that you have children sitting in safety resources now that are a part of your 215 uh, CPS in-home services cases, go ahead and look at those now and look and see what needs to happen or what can happen. Can those children return home? If so, they should, and you, you can continue working the case in that way. If, if situations are pretty severe and things are not turning around, um, go ahead and look at getting the court involved now so that when you have, come January 1, you're not starting this or you don't have a huge onslaught of perhaps court cases then. Go ahead and start working on those issues now. 
Um, so I just wanted to add that um, to, the, to the conversation. But just to summarize, we have covered a lot of material during this webinar. And it was really meant to be a pretty high level overview of some of the changes. We're going to take a deeper dive on some, a lot of these topics when we have our three hour face to face events that start next week. Um, and so, but we hope you have heard a lot of great ideas about how to start implementing or planning to implement these changes. Just as a reminder, a few of the topics we've covered today include a new approach and guidelines to safety planning. A re, there is a revised safety assessment tool, the use of safety actions that involve separation of, the, of a parent and child, safety actions that involve the restrictions of a parent to his or her child, restrictions of a parent's access to his or her child, um, and attention to both the safety and rights of the children and the rights of the parent. By providing a more concentrated focus on resolving safety issues as quickly as possible, making sure separation or restriction as a safety intervention is used as a last resort, reuniting children and families more quickly following separation and resolution of the safety issues, providing services that can support parents in resolving safety factors, and or finding other permanent solutions more quickly. All of these things help assure the safety and permanence and well-being of children. Also in adhering to the revised approach, we avoid the situations where children have remained in safety resources for lengthy periods of time. Many of us think of this and even call it out loud a pseudo foster care system. And as a result, children are deprived of such benefits. We have heard many anecdotal examples of children, um, youth, who are wanting to pr further their education and are applying for educational training vouchers and the NC REACH scholarship, only to find out that they are not eligible because they were never formally in the foster care system. They were simply placed out of their home in a safety resource placement. In addition, and Jamie mentioned this, the new approach is more trauma-informed because the time frames and focus on resolving the safety issues result in less trauma for the children involved, the parents, and the safety providers. And so this next slide really just kind of summarizes what I reviewed with you. Um, it kind of just opposes the, um, how it is helpful to counties as well as how it is beneficial for the families that we work with. And so at this point, I think we are ready to move into um, a period of question and answer. All right, well, I just want to thank all of you for your questions. Um, and as Arletta said, when they do these live events, um, they'll have a chance to get more deeply into the issue and answer some of the specifics. Um, so we've been keeping track in the chat pod and trying to um, track things that are common themes. Um, so I'm going to just pull up some that I think are ones that we should probably answer. I'm looking real quick. We've got a lot here. Um, so we had several questions of, regarding the issue of voluntary, um, regarding mental health issues and substance abuse, and if a parent is actively using uh, when you're having this conversation, um, how does that impact the issue of voluntary? So I'm not sure who wants to take that one. I can take it. Um, that is we that is a very good question, and we have gotten um, a good amount of questions about that as we have begun to roll out these policies and tools. And so one of the things that I would just like to emphasize with that is you really want to use your good assessment skills when you're talking with that parent or with those fa that family member. And certainly, if you have reason to believe that the parent may not understand, um, for any reason, maybe it's a language barrier, maybe they're illiterate, maybe there is a substance abuse or a mental health concern that is impairing their, their judgment. Use those assessment skills in making that decision about whether or not the, the person in good faith um, can enter into a temporary parental safety agreement with you. Um, 
if you have the evidence, and of course documenting that. Um, but if you have evidence to, that it's okay to move forward, then do so. Otherwise, I would say, you know, be in consultation as a worker with your supervisor, um, perhaps um, folks that within your legal team, the, your attorney, whatnot, in, in processing that and seeing what um, the appropriate next steps are. Great, thank you. Uh, we also have a few questions about timing of things, so I'm going to kind of lump these together. One was about do kids have to return home before they can go into in-home services? The second was when in this process does, says how soon does the CFT have to happen uh, when separation is part of the temporary parental safety agreement? Uh, like a call coming in after hours is the example that they gave. Gotcha. So I will talk about the first one, and, and it just went out of my head. What was the first one? <laughs> oh, yes. So there is a huge emphasis on what we talked about today. You'll also hear it in our face-to-face -face events. Separation is a last resort. Um, these are only going to be used if that is the only means to keep that child safe. Children want to be with their parents, parents want to be with their children, and so it's our job to help make sure that that can be done safely. And so in the event you do have a child who is uh, residing out of the home, um, in order for that case to transfer to in-home, that child would need to be living in the home with his or her parent, um, hence the name in-home services. Um, and so that will be a crucial point. If the child, for safety reasons, needs to remain separated from his or her parents, that's when you would get the court involved to have the court oversee that separation and sanction that. Um, regarding the time frame for holding a CFT, if you have to do something um, immediately, say after hours or on a weekend, um, it's very difficult to put a time frame on that knowing the different circumstances that may come up on any given day. Um, what, what we just say is as soon as one can be convened. This is not any different than what the CFT policy currently says around if you have to go ahead and pursue non-secure and you can't hold a CFT beforehand, you do it as soon as possible. Um, we may look to put a time frame in that before this gets released in January, but as of right now, it simply says as soon as possible. All right, we have had several questions regarding revoking um, that fall into various categories, but there are things like um, will, how will, will a parent, can a parent revoke without notifying someone um, at, at DSS, like will a revoke happen just if they say I'm revoking it and it's done. Um, there were questions about if um, either parent can revoke an agreement. Um, there was questions about if a parent revokes an agreement and does not agree to signing, um, and there are safety to signing an agreement, and there are no and there are safety risks, but not enough for court intervention. What are some other alternatives? So, several questions about revoking. I'm going to let Jamie handle this one. Um, so, Laura, um, I think that we all know that parents choose to revoke safety plans sometimes without notice to DSS. The goal with the sheet that we created was that it would give a process and give DSS notice prior to the revocation and perhaps some time to evaluate to see if it was okay at that point for the child to return home or did DSS need to take some action to assure the safety of the child, um, such as filing a petition. Um, I think you can encourage the parent that the, the forms you may create or the forms that you use will encourage the parents to give notice to social services. But just like now, you have to be prepared that some people will revoke without that prior knowledge. But I think if you educate people and they appreciate the time you've put into them, they would be more likely to give you notice, to call you, to talk to you, especially if they have concerns. So I think that 
be prepared that people may not always give you notice, but the goal is that they will give you notice. And what we've been told is that each county needs to develop a plan because each county is different. You know, are they going to call after hours if it's after hours that they want to revoke? Um, and so there has to be some flexibility in the policy. And I, I would just add, um, while this isn't um, something that we have always emphasize, um, revocation really has always been there. Um, we may not have, again, emphasized it with the families that we were working with, but parents have always had the option to say, yeah, I may have told you I was willing to do that yesterday, but today I changed my mind. So I would say, what are you doing now when parents change their mind about a part of the safety plan? And maybe think about using that after January 1. All right, so we have had, I know we've talked about this a bit already, but there are several questions still about um, increased caseloads, uh, lack of court time, lack of money. Um, so, but there are some bigger system questions I think might be worth answering. So one, um, what is the plan or is there a plan to involve the AOC in, in getting this information out to courts? And has anybody talked about doing training for judges? So as Laura mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we have many court partners on participating with us today. Uh, they also will um, be participating with us in the live events um, statewide. We at the state level have been having conversations with our peers over at the administrative office of the court. Um, and we started having those conversations back in April or May. Um, and their response is, has been, Thank you for the information. We will partner and work with you any way that we can um, in, in um, response to these changes. Um, we are always available to present at judges' conferences, um, attorney conferences. And I want to emphasize, this was something that came out yesterday. Um, we're not just going to make this effective January 1 and, and leave you high and dry. Um, at the division and those of us who are presenting today, we will remain a resource to you for ongoing technical assistance as you begin to roll this out and have some, encounter some practice challenges. Um, feel free to contact any one of us. Um, or in particular, your children's program reps, um, they will be the, the key um, point person for some of those questions and practice implications as you begin to roll out. And also, I would just like to add that one of the things that we've done that I truly appreciate is I think that North Carolina has been very, very proactive in this process. We have scheduled 45 events, and one is coming to a location near you. And we'd like for you to encourage all of your court partners to attend. This includes your judges, your GAL attorney advocates, your staff, any attorneys representing the child welfare agencies. We've certainly done that. In addition to that, we are making this webinar also available to you. It will probably take a couple of weeks or so to get it uh, to get it up and ready, but we are going to make this available to you as well. And I also just kind of reiterate what our letter has said is that we certainly are here for you and we will certainly help you make this happen. So I just appreciate the fact that uh, North Carolina has been uh, proactive in this and we also have put out many, many events that will, uh, will help you answer some questions. For example, today was just kind of like an appetizer, but there's going to, to have to be 45 more entrees coming that will give you more. You'll be in a classroom. It'll give you an opportunity to ask those questions and get your answers right there. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we have time for just a couple more questions. I'm trying to uh, just skim through the chat pod, which is very full. Um, so we have one question about, um, well, let me go back up here. This was one that I think several people wanted answered. Uh, major concern is that if a petition is filed due to the parent's refusal to sign a safety agreement, that there's going to be a gap in time when there's no safety agreement in place, but DSS is responsible for ensuring the child's safety. How do we deal with that? Uh, 
Um, in my opinion, this policy doesn't change your practice in determining when non-secure custody is necessary. So if you have a case where a parent has not entered into a safety plan of any type, not just a temporary parental safety agreement, but even if you're asking a parent to address issues in their own home with the children present, you have to evaluate if you meet the requirements of non-secure custody and if there's a substantial risk to the child justifying a non-secure custody order. So if you're in a situation where a parent is refusing to cooperate, that you go through that same process as you've traditionally done to determine if the only way to provide for safety of the child is through a non-secure custody order. All right. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. One more. Um, I just had one that I saw that I thought was a good one we should answer. So this says, if petitions are needed, do we file them in the assessment phase or transfer to in-home services and then file? I believe that the policy reads that um, you will file them prior to transferring to in-home services. Um, and so because it really is the judge adjudicating there, there is some sort of abuse neglect dependency found that would give the right and the authority to um, provide those in-home services. Um, and then, of course, the judge, if the child is uh, with a temporary safety provider, the judge could then sanction that um, plan as well. And so um, we may need to further look at that and provide some TA around this specific issue. But right now, the policy does say that you're filing prior to the transfer. All right, so as I said, I'm sure you are not satisfied with our ability to answer all of your questions. And we will just reiterate there are several different ways to get your answers. Um, one will be the follow-up document um, that we'll be providing with the frequently asked questions and answers on that will be um, in the next few days. and. We will make that available on NCSW Learn. We also, as Arletta and Dee have mentioned, there are going to be these live sessions where you will have an opportunity to ask more specific questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Dee, um, who's going to wrap us up for, um, for our webinar today. Thank you very much, Laura. I appreciate that. Um, I think I'd be remiss if I did not answer this one question because I think it's going to be very helpful for everyone. It's a question that says, uh, why is this not being piloted? It's, it's a very sweeping change and, in their opinion, not very family friendly or family centered. Um, so let me just respond to that really, really quickly. One of the things that North Carolina has done is they've done some very, very empirical research on what was happening in other states where this was concerned and other states were being sued. And when we talk about it not being family-centered, if you'll think about it for just a moment, we were uh, having safety resource placements and telling people that you must not visit with this person, you must not do this, you must not do that, and we really didn't have the legal authority to do that. In this case, if there is a legal authority, the court will tell them that. That is why there is a slide about visitation, because we were telling them without authority who they could visit with and who they could not visit with. These are some of the things that we that we have also seen as we look at safety resource placements in, um, in the program monitoring that, that we're doing. So if you'll think about it and just read your policy, I think it will be a little bit more family-centered because at least the parents will have an opportunity to have their rights heard uh, in court and, and their rights will be honored. So let me go ahead and wrap up. I just want to say that um, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I want you to know, I mentioned just a minute ago, that this really was is just an appetizer. So I don't want you to leave this session thinking, well, I don't really still, I still don't understand it. Any time that you are introduced to something new, you become aware. The knowledge happens as you get an opportunity to ask questions, and those questions are answered. So you're now at an awareness level. That knowledge is coming, I promise you. So as you think about this, when you get ready to, uh, to talk about it and as you leave the session, know that there are 45 events held statewide. 
One is to come into a location near you. So just please, as I said before, encourage court partners to attend. You, some of your staff it, attend so, the, so that you can get some of those uh, questions that j just were really burning uh, answered in the training room. And in 2017, there will be other courses that will offer curricular revise that will also include the new safety planning and assessment policies and procedures. I'm happy that we are with the state of North Carolina, who's very, very proactive. One of the things is that we haven't been sued uh, over this. <laughs> Some other states have. So, um, so we're, we're excited. So just make sure that you are coming to some of these. And I just want you to know that we said earlier um, we are available to you. Now, now that I've finished all that, uh, I would like for you to type something into chat for me. Uh, so do you can see that there's been a lot of answers to that chat question already. If you want to scroll back, there's been some excellent answers, specifically around um, talking about CFTs and their leadership. Um, talking with their judges and court and attorneys, um, getting started as soon as possible. Uh, there's been lots of excellent answers um, to what people are going to be doing to get started. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate uh, everything that you've done today. I want you to know that, that we our contact available, uh, information is available uh, to you. Uh, as you see up here, here's Arletta's uh, contact information and mine. Arletta and I are both with the state. That means that if you have questions about policy, please contact us. If you have county-specific questions, then go ahead and contact uh, Kevin and Jamie. And we're just excited that you were here. Thank you so very much. And I'm going to turn it all back over to Laura. Thank you, Dee. So, um, we know this has been a lot of information. There's some excellent information that you guys are sharing with each other in the chat pod. So I'm hoping we're going to be able to capture that all and share it back with you.